Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, which is available as an audiobook, a paperback, and the ebook is free. Yes, free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. Under the super secret pen name Robert Kent, I've written some novels for older readers. To find out more about those, and more importantly, for interviews with thousands of literary agents, authors, editors, publicists, book people, the world's best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. Esteemed audience, I couldn't be more thrilled. We have got a treat for you this week. Uh, my guest is not only one of my favorite authors, he's also one of my favorite people. And one day they're going to paint a picture of him on the side of a building right next to Kurt Vonnegut here in Indianapolis. Uh, my guest is Maurice Broaddus. Maurice, how are you? Good, good. Hanging in there. <laughs> I am going to do my best to pretend like I don't know you that well and ask a bunch of questions to which I already know the answer for the benefit of the audience. Uh, starting with, as the audience knows that I never make a guest sit through me fumbling through your biography or a description of your book. Why would you want to listen to me do either of those things when you're right there? Uh, so uh, start us off, give, uh, give an overview of your background and, and we'll get going. Sure. Uh, so I'm a, a science fiction and fantasy author. I've been in the industry for just over 20 years. Um, came up, my background was mostly in horror and then science fiction and fantasy. I have did this uh, wild foray into uh, middle grade books, middle grade detective novels specifically. Um, that's partly influenced by the fact that uh, I'm also a middle school teacher. I've been uh, uh, working at a middle school for the last five years or so. Um, oh man, no, it's my, I guess it's been longer than that now I think about it. Um, but yeah, so I've been uh, working at a middle school for quite a while now. Um, you know, and once the students find out that you're an author, they're like, hey, Mr. Brodsky, there's something that, of yours that we can read. And I'm looking at my catalog going no no there's not uh not unless uh you know i want a lot of conferences with your parents about you know what i'm doing over here so uh so yeah so it made it a lot easier for me to just start writing middle grade novels give them something to read um in my uh spare time such as it is i also do a lot of community organizing so uh that is also uh, you know working a lot in the neighborhood um, with a group of organized neighbors. We do a lot of, uh, uh, basically it boils down to leadership training of young people to uh, become, you know, gifts and stewards of the community. So that's me in a nutshell. Ah, it's a good start, but there is, there's so much to the, 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 the majesty that is Maurice Brown. <laughs> We're going to try and uh, break into a little bit uh, tonight. It occurs to me uh, that you are the first guest on the program that I have ever helped move. So, <laughs> um, so trying to figure out how you got going. I know that you earned a Bachelor of Science uh, in Biology uh, mm -hmm. for Purdue, and you worked for two decades as an environment toxicologist, mm -hmm. which, as, a, as one does, that, that obviously is a straightforward path toward being an author. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. First, want to be an author. Oh, I'm sorry, you missed that last part. Oh, when now? Uh, when was your? What's your first memory of wanting to be an author? Of wanting to be an author? I don't know if I ever wanted to be an author. Uh, I, I've been thinking for as long as I can. So, uh, so, so that's back to like second grade when uh, my teacher basically just gave me a stack of paper and just said, "Hey, just." create stuff uh and so uh, i've always just sort of been uh sort of you know down with the pen as it were uh in fifth grade i remember uh winning an essay a citywide essay contest um and then in uh high school my uh teachers in high school uh sort of were like wait we think there's a we, we think you got something here so they really encouraged me when it came to creative writing and, and just create, not just encouraging me, pushing me, pushing me, pushing me, uh, you know, because they're just like, no, no, no the, <laughs> we get what high school students are doing, but, you know, we need to push you a little further. So I was like, okay. Um, so, yeah, so I've always, I, I don't remember a specific point where I was like, oh, I want to be a writer per se. Um, other than when I was in uh, college and I, what, what was I get? I, what, I uh, got an honorable mention in the uh, Isaac Asimov's undergraduate writing contest. Um, and, and when I got that, that's when I took that as a sign of, well, maybe maybe I am meant to do this. 
So, uh, so I'd say probably in college, I'd probably buckle down and like, all right, let me see what would happen if I just really took some serious stabs at this. And I know you were a, a fan from way back when. Um, a little bird told me, and that little bird's name was Maurice Broadus. Uh, okay. <laughs> can you remember? We really got to do something about that leak in the organization. <laughs> yeah, that's the information pouring out. Um, but when you were younger and, and, and uh, kind of a closeted horror fan, there was an, a, an adult in your community that came to you and, and made you feel less alone. I can't do that story justice. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so I grew up in church, a, lot, a big church background. Um, and uh, I think I was in fourth grade, I believe. And, uh, you know, and it's, you know, grandmotherly uh, Sunday school teacher was telling us the story of uh, Noah and the ark and everything. And we had one of those flannel graphs on, on the board behind her. And there was an ark there and there was Noah there. And she invited each of the students to come up and, uh, you know, put a, a, one of the animals on, on the on the boat, as it were. So, you know, the pastor's son goes up, he puts up a, a lion, and then his buddy goes up, puts up a giraffe. And then uh, I go up and I take some of the felt uh, people and then put them on top of the water. Um, because I'm just like, this is the story you just told us, right? And and so that marked time I was kicked out of Sunday school class. And uh, another Sunday school teacher heard about this incident, invited me over to his place, um, you got to keep in mind, this is a, lot, a much more uh, innocent age, as it were. And so, I, you know, I go over to his house, you know, we're eating pizza. And then he's like, hey, I got something I got want to show you. And so he, he takes me back to this uh, back room. And again, much more innocent age. Um, but he opens up this door. And it's like all of these wonders are, are in this room, right? There's like, he has all these uh, VHS tapes of like Doctor Who episodes and Star Trek, the original series episodes. He has rows and rows of comic books. And then he has this whole row of just like Stephen King novels. And he's just like, yeah, I think you're secretly one of us. And, uh, and, and that's when, uh, yeah, so that's what made me feel a lot less alone in, in terms of uh, what I was doing. I mean, it's kind of still, not, looking back, it's still kind of a shame that we all had to like, form the secret club within church. Like, we can't let anyone find out that we're into horror and comic books and sci-fi, but, you know, that's just where we found ourselves. But, um, yeah, it was a, it, it was one of those four, uh, I've, I even think back to, because that was like, man, I was like fourth or fifth grade at that point. And then, as it turns out, a buddy of mine, his, his mom was making him give up collecting comic books, so he gave me his comic book collection. And I remember picking up the first issue of uh, X-Men. It was like X-Men uh, issue 136. And that was the first comic book I ever read. And I was just like, oh, no. Oh, no, I think I found the things I love reading. <laughs> so that, that was it for me and reading. I was like, all right, we're going down this comic book uh, wormhole right now. <laughs> So there it was, an inseparable bond for you forever. Uh, and so what is it uh, that, that gets you to go into environmental toxicology first rather than straight toward writing uh, and comics and, and this, this secret oh. that's uh, burning the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I, I found a, a – it's, it's funny. I just found a book that I – a book uh, that I wrote when I was in fifth grade and, uh, and it detailed out even even back then that I wanted to be both a scientist and a writer um, and apparently 10 year old me also had a lot of anger issues I was like reading this and it was just like oh my goodness apparently I wanted to be a mad scientist on top of that um, so there, there's that but uh, no I was the first person in my family to go to college and uh, when I, I was a uh, uh, discussing my, my choices over with my mother and everything she was just like and I, I mentioned the whole writing thing and uh, she was just like yeah we're i'm not gonna pay for uh someone to go you know i'm not gonna pay for you to have a writing degree sorry that's just not in the cards i need you to do something respectable was the word she used um and so i was like all right fine what's your definition of respectable and her definition of respectable was uh going into nursing um, my mom is, uh, is Jamaican. And so, uh, she came over and she became a nurse and, and that became her definition of, of, res you know, a, a respectable occupation. So, you know, we went back and forth uh, over this, uh, possibility of me becoming a nurse, but I was just like, mom, I am a professional daydreamer. Well, maybe not professional at the time, but I'm definitely a daydreamer. I mean, that's what I do. Uh, and so if I become a nurse, I'm going to die. I don't know what to tell you. They will just, they were, people were just going to die. Um, and so we went back and forth. And so science, uh, me being a biology major, that became our compromise right there. 
So uh, went through school, you know, I, I, beginning of school, my freshman year of college, you know, I set down the pen. I'm not not doing writing. I'm pursuing my science degree and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I quit writing. And I think I quit writing for two years before one day I just found myself, you know, pen in hand, pen starting to sketch out a story. And I'm just like, no, because this is what I am meant to do. I am a writer. This is what I do. I I do this like I've and so, uh, so I just started, you know, using all of my electives to take writing classes and uh, uh, elect uh, different sort of writing classes, you know, all, all the way through independent study courses. And I basically have an undeclared major in English uh, alongside my, my biology degree. Uh, so, yeah. And, and so, but when I graduated, uh, the first job that actually the, uh, while I was still in school uh, I was working at, at the environmental toxicology lab and then when I graduated the the guy who ran the business offered me the full-time position so I was like well um I have a job in hand it's a job that allows me plenty of time to get my writing done we're just going to do this for as long as we can and so uh, I did that for about 20 years <laughs> uh, so so after those two years and that 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 must have been a different world. I can't even imagine a Maurice that doesn't write. But two years, you're not right. Right. Not right. at full time, or, or what does it look like once you once you decide that I'm going to pursue this at least quasi seriously? And when when do you decide I'm going to go all the way serious? Hmm. So let's see. So I graduate in 1993 with my bright, uh, bright and shiny biology degree. I immediately start writing what would would become my first novel. And so uh, I start writing in 93. I finish it in 2000, um, which also was the first year. Well, first year. It was also the year I got married. Um, and then once I completed it, I took a year to revise it. And so then I finished my revision on, see, I believe it was May 13th, uh, 2001. Finished the revision of the book. Uh, I know this date because my wife was in labor at the time uh, with my firstborn son, and I really, really, really wanted to finish the revision of the rough draft of, of the draft of my novel. So I was like, "Honey, if you could just hold it for a little bit longer, I am almost done. I can get this done. I know labor's going on for a bit, but you know, I don't know. Hold your legs together. Do whatever. I got. I'm almost done here. <clears throat> I, I, I finished the rough draft. I mean, I finished the revision. We shoot to the hospital." get there just too late for her to have an epidural um so she has to go natural uh childbirth which was not what we had planned um and so you know 22 years later she still hasn't quite gotten over this fact um but you know God, wait, no. wait. how has she not murdered you <laughs> i know right i know right but uh but yeah so wait what's your question i've done I get off I on these stories. About, uh, when you transitioned from you were gonna you were gonna work the job, you were gonna uh, be gainfully employed, and you were mm -hmm. gonna have time to write. But then when you go from I'm gonna have time to write to I'm definitely gonna be so serious writing that I will be revising while my wife's in labor. When does that decision get made? It, it doesn't get made. I mean, like I said, this is just who I am. So when we were dating, she knew I was writing. When we were on the, when we were on the honeymoon, I was writing. Um, I mean, obviously, I would take breaks, but <laughs> you know, but during the honeymoon, I was writing. I I can still remember the short stories I was working on uh, on the honeymoon. As a matter of fact, like, and none of those short stories. Wait, hang on, I think one of those short, short stories did eventually see the light of day. But, uh, um, nope, none of those short stories I was working on at the time saw the light of day. Um, same with uh, the first novel, never saw the light of day. But at this point, though, I'm like, no, this is seriously, this is what I'm about. This is uh, who I want to be. This is what I want to pursue. Um, and, and it was that first novel. The reason I wanted to get it done is because I got, like I said, I got it done in 2001. And I had no idea what the next steps were for uh, publishing. You know, I'm just like, I was so focused on get it done, get it done, get it done. Once I got it done, I was just like, what do I do now? Um, and actually, I asked that question, what do I do now? And so, uh, uh, in answer to that question, uh, okay, not really an answer to the question, but in pursuing an answer to this question, I end up writing. Cause like I, now I was I was a huge well, yeah I was a huge comic book collector at this point, and so I wrote my favorite comic book at the time, which was uh, Starman. It was being written by James Robinson, and uh, so I wrote 
wrote this uh, comic. I wrote James Robinson at Starman, and just like, hey, here's where I'm at. I'm a horror writer. Finished my first novel. I have no idea what to do next. Got any advice for me? And uh, and so he publishes my letter in the in issue of uh, Starman. And uh, to which he responds, I should probably write a, a, an advice column for writers. Um, and then that's pretty much all, the only response he gives me. Was, was that not what to do next or anything like that? Just a, he probably ought to start an advice column. I'm like, oh, all right. Well, that was not real helpful. Um, <laughs> but a couple weeks later, I get a, a, a letter in the mail. Because uh, back then, if you, publish a, uh, if, if you send in a letter, if you didn't say otherwise, they would publish your address also. And so, uh, and I didn't say otherwise. So they published my letter, they published my address. Two weeks later, I get a, a letter in the mail and it's uh, from a writer, his name's uh, Wayne Allen Sally. And, uh, and he's just like, hey, couple things. One, I'm a horror writer also. Two, Starman's my favorite comic book also. Three, the World Horror Convention is gonna be held up here in Chicago this year. Why don't you come to it? We can meet and I can introduce you around. And so, I turned to my wife and it's just and and now <laughs> newborn son. As a matter of fact, she's also pregnant with the second one. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> I'm gonna pop out of town for a week uh, to meet a guy I've never met before, to be introduced to a bunch of folks I've never met before, in the hopes that I will somehow figure out what it is to, I'm supposed to do with my writing career. We good? All right, I'm out. Um, and so that's why I did it. I, your wife continues to grow. I know, right? Remember, remember <laughs> 22 years later, we're still together. So there is that. So, so this does actually pay off uh, at some point. But uh, yeah, so off I go to the World Horror Convention and uh, my life has basically changed as I meet some of the folks who are, who would go on to become some of my best friends still in my life. As a matter of fact, I've talked to a good chunk of them this the last couple of days, as a matter of fact. Um, as a, but they introduced me around. I was welcomed into the horror community and, and to start to figure out, you know, the whole business side of uh, being a writer. Do you have a feeling when you're there at last that I'm where I belong? Here I am. This is these are my people. Well, let's see. Um, was it world at that world horror? Because uh, uh, leading up to the world horror, they had a, a, a writing contest as a part of it, and I ended up getting um, again a. a I think, yeah, I got an honorable mention in, in the short story contest. Uh, and my award is actually behind me right now. And it was an award and it was handed to me by Neil Gaiman. And, uh, and I'm just like, ah, one of my favorite writers is handing me an award uh, about my writing. I am, once again, I, I, I firmly believe I'm on the right track <laughs> with this. <laughs> and then, uh, then the next year I go on to win the, writing, that, the World Horrors uh, writing contest. Uh, for a short fiction, and then uh, that story ended up getting published in Weird Tales. And we're gonna we're gonna talk quite a bit about your new middle grade novel, Unfadeable, which releases May tenth, twenty twenty two. That's Tuesday, esteemed audience. If you're listening to us as this comes out, you can pre order. If you're listening to this after it came out, go do it. It's already available. Just go get it. So Unfadeable by Maurice brought us. But I know that you love a good short story. That in fact, short stories are your that's your preferred medium, right? Oh yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I love short stories. Uh, I, I love short stories, and uh, in fact, when I was taking the seven years to write the the novel, uh, one of the things that kept me going was the fact that I would take breaks every so often and then just write some short stories, just so I could have that rush of you know getting to the end of a writing project. So, and uh, even though I just uh, turned in the uh, uh, second draft of, I mean, the first draft of. Uh, the second uh, novel in my, I also have a, an adult sci-fi series. I just turned in the sec, the first draft of the second book of that. In the last month of writing that book, uh, with, you know, in order to give myself some space to think, I end up writing a bunch of short stories. I think I wrote a short story a week during the last month of uh, the, uh, writing that, that, that novel. And to me, that just sounds like a lot of extra work. Um, what is it about writing those short stories that energizes you and gets you to a point where you can write that, that full long draft? Because I know you're famous for this. You've always got a deadline coming up and you're doing something else on top of what you need to do for the deadline. Right, right. Um, and so I, I, I do have this down to a science where I'm actually using writing to procrastinate from writing. So it does allow me to give the illusion of uh, being productive when actually it's just me stalling from doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I've just found a productive way of doing it. Um, but no, short stories allow me to do a couple of things. So one, it allows me to experiment with writing. 
So I get to uh, build different writing muscles. Like I get to experiment with voice and I get to experiment with uh, form and uh, I get to experiment with characterization or, or, you know, or even world building. And speaking of world building, that's the other thing I use the, the short stories for is to uh, help me think through some of the world building aspects of whatever working on. So um, while I was working on the, the my first novel, Sweep of, well, the first of my sci-fi trilogy, it's, uh, it's called Sweep of Stars. I think I've wrote probably a dozen short stories in that world so I could flesh out different areas of the world building for, for the novel. And so so I just kept, keep that up. And so a lot of the stories I was writing for in this cycle was about you know doing some of the world building for the second book. So I was trying to figure out, well, what does the magic system look like here? Well, I don't know, let's figure it out. And I think I wrote three stories just about the magic system in, in the world. Um, and then there was a background character who is appears for exactly one chapter in the entire novel, but I was just like, oh, I wonder what her backstory is. So then I wrote a short story just to flesh out her backstory. Um, and then as it turns out, she's a much more fascinating figure than I thought. So I might have to, in the revision of the book, be like, well, maybe I'll do a little bit more with you, you know, that sort of thing. So, you know, that's why I just love short stories. It seems like you're, you're stalling, but then you are, but you're also... <laughs> You're doing the work and then on top of doing all that world building, now you've got some stories, some of which, if not all, will be sold elsewhere and can be used as direct tie-in promotions for your novel. They absolutely, they have actually, as of today, uh, they have all sold and uh, and, and that's and they'll be coming out, yeah, uh, between now and uh, leading up to the next book. So, so yeah, they, and each time a story comes out, that's an, uh, an opportunity to keep my name out there to... Uh, remind folks I do the thing and also remind them that, hey, these all tie into the novel series. So it's a continual promotion for all of that. The genius to this madness. If you, if you look close, you'll see it. There it is. <laughs> right. It's buried in there somewhere. <laughs> and uh, what well, you mentioned, Sweep of Stars. So we should talk a little bit about uh, Afrofuturism because you are the resident Afrofuturist uh, at the, I never say it right, it's, it's Kepper Institute, right? Yep, the Kepper Institute. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, please define for us, what is an Afrofuturist and how does that enable you to, as I know you you give talks uh, around the world at this point, right, as yeah. an Afrofuturist? Yeah, so Afrofuturist, uh, being a resident Afrofuturist uh, at the Kepper Institute, so Afrofuturism is a uh, so it's futurism, and many organizations have futurists on staff, right? People who, um, it's basically their job to project and, and figure out what, what is coming down the pike in terms of, of technology or where society is going to be at or the interaction of technology with uh, where we're moving as a society, things like that. Um, but with Afrofuturism, it's that same sort of thing, except it's all rooted in the African-American experience, right? So it's all rooted in the Black cultural imagination. And so with Afrofuturism, what you have is, especially with, with the literary, uh, with, with especially with using with the art, you have the critique of the present that is rooted in the past, but always with an eye of what is good, of imagining ourselves into the future, right? And so there's always this sort of retrofuturism to what, what it is to be a, an Afrofuturist. And at the Kepper Institute, being that, uh, uh, being that the resident Afrofuturist is sort of like a, a statement by the organization that says, hey, um, we have a resident Afrofuturist who dreams alongside the other Afrofuturists in, in our organization, people who are dreaming of their, uh, of our desired, you know, future states, you know, we, we want, there's a future we wish to create um, that we envision together alongside one another, we envision this thing collectively as neighbors, and once we can picture this world that we're trying to create, we can begin to enact that world now in the present. So a lot of the problems that we're facing as, as a community, everything from uh, living in a food desert to uh, mass incarceration and, uh, and the criminal justice system to um, red line, the housing crisis that, that we live in, you know, what, what's our job? Our job is to, uh, it's not to fix the systems that we're in. No, it's because those systems have never served us and making them better is still not going to serve us. But what does it look like to reimagine these systems and reimagine how we move through the spaces that we find ourselves in? So that, that's the, the job of, of the Afrofuturist. So we're, 
we're having on the one hand we're having fun because we're we're talking sci-fi we're talking imaginative stories but we're also hopefully and when i say we i mean you are uh, finding uh, solutions to future problems that somebody is, is hopefully going to enact and it's going to make the world better right Right. Well, I mean, it's just, it's no different than uh, Star Trek, you know, right? So you, Star Trek paints these uh, u- utopian visions of of how we could be as a society, as a group of uh, as explorers. Uh, you know, they sort of fix all the problems on Earth, and so basically, and by doing that, what have they done? They've painted a vision that people can begin to work towards, right? Same thing with Afrofuturism. It's like, hey, we're we're painting this picture. Uh, with us in it, mind you. <laughs> so so that, that's part, that's the, as Tanan Reeves said, that's the first act of resistance is imagining ourselves into the future. Um, and it gives us something to work towards. Before we move on, uh, let's give a team audience what they need to know to be, while they're pre-ordering their copy of uh, Un- Un- uh, Unfatable, they can go ahead and they can just straight purchase their copy of Sweep of Stars. What do they need to know about Sweep of Stars? So Sweep of Stars, is uh, book one of the Astro Black trilogy. Um, it was uh, it was pitched as uh, the uh, Black Panther meets the Expanse, and so what we have is an intergalactic uh, Pan African community known as Moongano. Uh, it uh, it begins on a, a, with a lunar outpost, and then it has expanded into parts of Mars. Uh, there's a section of Mars known as Bronzeville. Uh, it extends to one of the moons of, of Saturn, Titan. It extends out. Uh, a mining colony. colony. Um, so, w- w- so this is the, the intergalactic uh, Pan African community, and uh, and there's a, also a wormhole. And on the other side of the wormhole, there uh, there's a military unit that's doing some exploration on the other side of that wormhole. Um, and you know, shenanigans happen. Um, and so, and then the other storyline is uh, there is a, a, a research starship. Um, because in this world, the starships are, are powered by jazz music because, because, and uh, <laughs> so, um, but you, you have this uh, research uh, class uh, starship that uh, is also exploring the universe. And, uh, and, and that's uh, that, that sweep of stars. Uh, you, so it's this vision of this, uh, you know, possible future world. But then, you know, even with this uh, utopian vision, you know, it still has to wrestle against, you know, it's, you know, you have a utopia, it can either exist in isolation, or it's going to have to struggle against, you know, interacting with the rest of the uh, known reality. And in this case, there are struggles when it comes to a uh, you know, interacting with what is referred to as OE, or original Earth, and the conflicts that arise because of that. So... Uh, do we know? Do you just turned in draft uh, the, your your final draft or uh, a draft uh, for uh, for book two? Do we have an idea when that might be available? Uh, so so book one just dropped a couple weeks ago. So about a year from now, uh, if things stay on course, you should be getting uh, Breath of Oblivion, which is a uh, book two. Plus many a short stories in the meantime, and then theoretically about a year after that, and several more short stories. Book three. Book three, uh, tentatively titled A City Dreaming. Got you. So more than enough to keep you going, esteemed audience. When you get done with that, make sure you check out the uh, Kingmaker Trilogy, uh, which is uh, your, 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 you have written now a little bit of everything. You you, you start off uh, not quite in horror. I mean, it's, it's urban fantasy, but I've read it. It's horror. Yeah. <laughs> there, there well, are- because, all right, so because book one, Kingmaker, was in my head when I was writing Kingmaker, I was writing a vague horror novel. That is a, absolutely what I was writing. Um, it's just when the book sold, the publishing company was like, "Yeah, that's great, but we're going to say it's we're, we consider it an urban fantasy." And I'm just like, "Oh, all right. I guess now I'm an urban fantasy writer." So that's how that shift happened. <laughs> I mean, do you have like a? So we're going to get to the middle grade as well, but do you have like a grand plan to eventually write a little bit of everything, or just like whatever comes along? Yeah. It's whatever comes along. So, like, right now, I am trying not to write a British cozy mystery series because that's something that. Look here, look at a. I'm not going to put up with any judgment. That was a supportive laugh. I support you writing a British right. cozy mystery. Uh, and uh, and uh, well, and my my agent gave me the same sort of supportive laugh, uh, which you know was code for you are under contract for a lot of stuff right now. So why don't we focus on getting that stuff done? But on the flip side, if you do actually write it, 
know that it would take us no time at all to sell that series. So I'm like, oh, so there's that. <laughs> when I laugh like that, if it's just you and me in person, I'll follow it up by, uh, by a joke because I can't help myself. But it is a laugh of great respect and even a little bit of envy that while you have all of this other stuff going on, <laughs> you also have room in your brain for a British cozy mystery. Because uh, I know another little bird whose name was Maurice Broadus uh, told me this uh, this past Saturday that Monday you were going to start a brand new middle grade book, which I'm very excited about. How'd that, how'd that work out? It's Tuesday as we record this. Did that get started? Uh, I am knee deep. Uh, you, uh, I guess your audience can't see this, but I'm holding up uh, some documents, which is the beginning of my research into uh, what's going to be a historical middle grade novel. I suppose we can't say much about that yet, but I've, I've heard the premise and the history that it's based on. I can't be, I couldn't be more excited. I'm uh, looking yep. forward to, to when it's available. Yep. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm curious to see how it'll turn out, frankly. So as I am with most of my projects, it starts off with a wild idea and I'm like, oh, I wonder how I'll pull that off. So if that becomes I, a British cozy mystery, then you really blow my mind. Right, right. <laughs> you pull that off. I guess the British folks that have to come to Indianapolis. <laughs> <laughs> which i'm not above doing keep that in mind that's pretty standard for you to have um multiple ideas going in your head at any given time multiple now how many i mean on average what are you comfortable with is there like a comfortable if i don't have at least three story plates spinning uh yeah, so in my head, am I comfortable or it's a th three to six is where i usually operate uh and then um is it is it just like which one calls to me the strongest that I'm that I'm gravitating toward, or is it literally just like okay, well, I put this one off for three stories, and the deadline is such, and I better get it done now? Yeah, it's pretty much deadline driven. So right now, the as of today, since I just turned in two short stories, I can now focus on uh, getting this uh, middle grade book uh, done and out the door. So, so while I'm working on the middle grade, everything else would just sort of pause. But uh, as ideas come to me for those other projects, I would just start slotting them away in the respective files so that uh, when I'm ready to turn my attention to them, they'll be ready to go. So how did you uh, get into uh, middle grade to start with, with the beautiful usual suspects, which is available now, esteemed audience? Check out my review at middlegradeninja.com. I loved it naturally. Uh, and you're going <laughs> to love it too. How did you, how did you decide that middle grade was also something you wanted to work on? Um, so I have two, two boys uh, now, I guess two young men, but at the time, two boys. Um, I think they were like, how old were they? Uh, 10 and 11 at the time and uh and i was trying to engage them as readers and so i uh so one i wanted to engage them as readers to chronicle some of their act their antics because uh my two sons they're just known for their antics off in school and there is no there is no record of uh of, of of their antics, so let me let me sort of create that, and so I decided to, to do some fictionalized uh, uh, and uh, fi fictionalized version of their antics they were pulling off in school. One of the things I was doing at the time is I was also because uh, by this point I was no longer a scientist, so I had much more free time on my hands, um, and uh, I was shadowing them through school by being a sub at whatever school they were in. And so, but uh, one of the class classes at the school that they were in was called the special ed class. And I really sort of fell in love with that class. Um, and so, and so that was another thing I wanted to, to just sort of pay, pay a, a, a give a nod to was the fact of, you know, this class, even though they've, you know, it's a bunch of students who've basically been written off as troublemakers, as um, emotionally delinquent or whatever they were calling them. Uh, I was just like, like, no, this is a room full of, like, brilliant students. Uh, and, and so I just wanted to, to sort of do something to sort of speak to, to their brilliance. So, so with Usual Suspects, it is all of that. It's thinly veiled antics of my children. It is my first forays as a teacher, uh, what it looked like for me as a teacher. And there was also uh, me chronicling, you know, the, the lives of, uh, of these students. And so, uh, and I finished that book in uh, 2012, and that, and and I did all of that so I could sort of the idea of uh, a Walter Mosley type crime novel for children, <laughs> right? So, I had all these things going on in my head, 
uh, I wanted to sort of bring to bear for usual suspects and then present it to my son to see if it, he would find it entertaining enough to read. And so uh, that's why the my, that's why the book is dedicated to my oldest son because he has declared himself my my original editor. Uh, and so he was the first editor of that project. So so there you go. Um, that was in uh, 2012. But even when I finished the book in 2012, um, I don't know. My gut told me this book is dead on arrival. The, 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 there's no room in the, in the world for for this book right now. It's, it's a middle grade detective novel. It has two young black boys as the lead. Uh, there's no way the marketplace uh, is going to embrace this book, and that had been pretty much my experience. You know, like I said, at this point, I've been in in uh, publishing for 10 years. I know the uphill battle I've been having for each and every story of mine that was getting published, you know, was a slugfest, usually with the editors, uh, to convince them that, no, I don't need to change the race of my characters in order to tell the story. You know, so things like that. So I was just like, oh, this book is going to be a, whew, a huge slugfest, uh, you know. So, I, so I, in a lot of ways, we just consider it a dead on arrival. But uh, the, some things happened and I had to, you know, I got distracted by other things going on in my life. And so was, when we came back around in 2016, me and my agent were just like, all right, we got to gotta send this book out. But by this point, um, I shifted in the industry. So like things like the We Need Diverse Books movement has had now happened. And so now there's a, uh, now there's a demand for like books like this. And so now, you know, I'm like, oh, well, now we're, I've gone from a book that was dead on arrival to a book poised for an easy sale, which is what happened. So uh, that helped, uh, you know, and that, thus history happened and the book sold and here we are. That was post-2012 that editors were trying to get you to change the race of your characters? Yes. What a world we live in. But that's... <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll move on, but uh, thank God for, for everyone who participated and we need diverse books. It was Absolutely. needed and it's still needed. Keep going. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you get uh, uh, usual suspects out there and then at that point, do you catch the middle grade bug? Uh, if by bug you mean I signed a two-book deal, yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> so it's a two-book deal with an option for a third. So uh, I got the bug. And uh, so user, sus user suspects, you know, does, does really well. And so uh, I was sitting in the classroom. Uh, now at this point, I have uh, one of my former students is shadowing me this day uh, because I decided that she's going to be my intern. And so she's now in year one of her internship with me, um, an internship no one, no one had asked for. And <laughs> I certainly wasn't looking for an intern at the time, but suddenly she is like, I'm your intern, Mr. Broadus. And we go, okay. So, uh, so she's interning with me and um, the email comes through on the computer. And so it's just like, oh, and it's my editor, and they're like, well, uh, we want you to uh, pitch a, a second idea for what your next book could look like. And so she's reading over my shoulder because she's a teenager and nosy, and I have no privacy, apparently. And she's like, oh, Mr. Broadus, you know, that sounds hard. You know, you got to come up with a, an idea for a book. And I'm like, no, ideas are the easy part. And so I was like, da, 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 da. boom, there, I just pitched you as an idea. Then I looked around the classroom and I just picked like three or four students. I just like pitched them as ideas for, for books. And uh, uh, like I said, ideas are the easy part. It's just coming up with it after the idea. That's, that's where, that's where you're in your money. Right. And so, uh, and it wasn't, man, it wasn't even 30 minutes later. They write back and like, Oh, Hey, that Bella character, she sounds really interesting. You should write the book about her. And, uh, and the actual, not the actual, but the Bella inspiration is right there when that email comes. Yeah. So, so my student, whose name is Bella, was sitting right there, and she's like, "Mr. Broadus, Bella does sound interesting. You really should write that Bella book." And I'm like, "Okay, yeah, <laughs> we'll write the Bella book, I guess." And now she gets a cut of every copy of Unfatable I assume. Oh, do not put that idea in her head. <laughs> but the book was dedicated to her, so there's that. <laughs> Payment enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Take note, esteemed audience, of the brilliance of this setup, that there you are in a middle school classroom pitching ideas for books to the target audience to see what they respond to. Right. And shockingly, they respond to themselves. There's that. Well, sure. 
Well, that brings us uh, directly to Unfadeable, which is available May 10th. Get your copy of Steamed Audience pre-order now, or if you're listening after, get your copy as it's available. What do we need to know about Unfadeable? So Unfadeable, uh, again, is, so it's a, another uh, middle grade detective novel uh, featuring a, a young uh, uh, middle school student. Her name is Bella Fades. Um, but her uh, street name is Unfadeable because she's a, a street ta- a street artist. She likes to tag buildings. She likes to uh, tag uh, overpasses. That's that's just her her thing. And so uh, so young Miss Fades is uh, trying to you know summer school now. She actually goes to the same school as uh, the cast of characters from uh, Usual Suspects. She does attend their school, but uh, it's summer break and she's looking to you know see if uh, she can find any support to create a, a little arts program in, in her neighborhood so that the kids could be occupied over the summer. Well, as she's, you know, winding her way through, you know, trying to figure out what, what it means to reach out to organizations to get this money, she slowly becomes, uh, she slowly starts to uncover the fact that there's a lot of neighborhood corruption when it comes to doling out money uh, in the community. And so uh, after getting on the wrong side of a couple of the uh, villains in the, na- in the area, she comes under the uh, auspices of, a, of a, a retired private investigator. And uh, he sort of takes her under his wing and, uh, and, and sort of teaches her what it means to be a, an investigator without stepping in to investigate himself. He's like, I will equip you to do your own investigation. And so, uh, so she becomes, she is this detective in training and she goes out to uh, figure out what's going on in the neighborhood. And well, th- again, why I love middle schoolers is uh, they are so pure, but their processes, uh, while, they, while they have all, all sorts of growing ideas, their processes are still a mess. Um, and so uh, <laughs> she proceeds to make a mess of things in ways only middle school students can uh, as she's going through and uh, you know investigating all this neighborhood corruption, so that would be unfadeable. Uh, who's the ideal reader for this story? Um, well, I'm especially uh, aiming it at, uh, at at young ladies because, uh, like I said, the first book aimed at my my in my head my target audience was was young boys, and this one it's uh, young ladies with the because uh, uh, Bella even wears a shirt uh, her, her the shirt she's known for it says Black Girl Magic on it. Um, and it's, it really is a lot about empowerment. It's a lot about agency. Um, it's a lot about perseverance. Um, Bella has to deal with a lot during the course of the story and, uh, her ability to keep getting up after being knocked down is, uh, I think at the very heart of the story. And I want to ask you about Cheshire Burke, because I know she wrote her whole <laughs> her whole dissertation on uh, 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 Black Girl Magic. I assume she's read the book and fallen in love with it? She has not read the book. Uh, Cheshire Burke is uh, one of my best friends in the industry, and we make a point of not reading each other as much as possible, mostly to annoy each other. <laughs> and so uh, what one of... Uh, one of our caveat things is that uh, we we have to we end up getting because I feel like we just had this conversation that uh, uh, I'm not going to ask her to read Sweep of Stars for example because I'm going to be big enough that she'll have no choice but to have to read and then teach Sweep of Stars in her college courses um, because our relationship is fueled by pettiness and this is the kind of petty antics that we love to do with one another uh, so there's that. <laughs> Uh, and then um, I know that uh, for a while you were the executive director of the Cities of Refugee Ministries. Mm-hmm. And so you were uh, helping with transitional housing and employment opportunities for people dealing with uh, addiction, reentry, mm-hmm. homelessness. And, and we do see some of those things in this novel. Um, how much does your training and your experience play into this story? Actually, we can go back even further. So Cities of Refuge comes uh, after... Uh, uh, I, you know, because I was a scientist for a while, that you know, end up going, going, putting that all that away, and uh, as, as I'm trying to figure out what's next, I end up uh, partnering with someone, and we start Cities of Refuge. But all of that happens uh, five years after. So uh, we go back to the Knights of Breton Court series. So Knight, Knight of Breton Court, that was uh, basically the Legend of King Arthur, um, told. Uh, set here in, in modern Indianapolis and is told through the eyes of unhoused teenagers and, and gang members. 
uh, because at the time I was uh, volunteering at a, a, a ministry for homeless uh, teens. And so, uh, so that was that. That was actually the the beginning of uh, of of me working in that area. So, I, you know, I, I worked for for that uh, the homeless teen ministry. Worked worked there for a while. I would go through start uh, cities of refuge as uh, you know for adult men, and then all that sort of feeds into. So, so we have all of that plus all of my community organizing world that sort of feed into uh, Unfadeable at this point. Gotcha. And when you're talking about subjects um, well, like homelessness, like um, um, yeah, like homelessness, when you're dealing with that and you're not writing uh, urban fantasy that we both know is horror, but that you're writing for um, younger readers uh, to, to enjoy, um, do you, um, I don't know, pull your punches a little bit is the right word, but soften some of the darker truths about uh, about the reality uh, of homelessness and and, and 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 the nature of the of what's going on in the story without spoiling. Nope. Okay. Good story. <laughs> 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 well, because because when the things that uh, you know, because and I'll have the, I've had, had these sort of conversations with like my editor and things like that, because uh, I work with I, like I said I work with middle school students, and so a I know how smart they are, but b I also know how much they have to deal with. Um, there's a lot that they deal with that people just don't even realize they they deal with. Like and again, ha having worked in the homeless teen ministry, it's like I know how many homeless teenagers there are. I uh, know the, the the precarious housing situation and how many end up unhoused and how many are couch surfing. I mean, it's uh, people would be stunned to know just what what these kind of numbers are, right? And uh, I know these are the things that uh, the students are dealing with on, on 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 a regular basis. So there's a whole lot of you know this, this dark reality that I think we're shielding them from, but it's like yeah, but they are there. This is their world. I'm literally just writing about their world. And so, uh, so I don't feel the need to pull punches because life hasn't pulled any punches on them. So uh, we, we just take it from there. And, the, and that's part of one of the themes of the book is how life has not pulled any punches uh, on, on Bella just because she's a teenager. So plenty of life has happened that she has to deal with. And so she, this is where we are. And this is a story with, that uh, she ends up having to deal with. It is sort of an absurd notion that uh teens or uh, middle grade uh, readers would have to live in this world, but wouldn't be able to read about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. So uh, like with Usual Suspects, I mean, the, the students in Usual Suspects, that is their lived experience, what, what happens in that book. That is literally their lived experience. Um, they are labeled from a young age. They have to learn how to navigate the world uh, with this label on them. And then still figure out what does it mean to have autonomy? What does it mean to have agency? And what does it mean to try and take the world on, on, on their terms? Uh, with Unfadeable, um, yes, she's young. And, and there's a very complicated uh, set of situations that she now has to find herself, especially going up against, you know, what could, at some points, government level corruption that she's trying to deal with as a 14-year-old. And, and the, the situation is complicated. The situation is complicated for adults, <laughs> much less for, for teens. But that's part of the commentary. She's just like, wait, hang on. This is the system y'all have come up with in order just to come up with an art project, money for an art project. This is the system a bunch of grown folks got together and said, oh, this is the way we need to do things. This is ridiculous. And that's part of the commentary of, uh, of Unfadeable, because, yeah, a lot of our systems are fairly ridiculous in how we do things. <laughs> It's hard to uh, get annoyed with a teenager that says this this is terrible when you know, they got a point. Yeah. Right. They got a point. <laughs> well spun. <laughs> I know that your style does change somewhat when you're writing middle grade versus when you're writing adult. Mm -hmm. um, other than a shorter word count and more frequent uh, paragraphing, what, what, what are things that you change about your style for a uh, middle grade audience? Yeah, I can't cuss as much as teenagers actually do. So there's that. So <laughs> that is a shame. <laughs> right. um. <laughs> fine with it, but uh, some librarian who we love librarians, but some adults would uh, would would take offense uh, and and let everyone know online. I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, no. The thing that I, I don't know if how much I actually do change writing style 
um, because I don't really, I don't do students anyway, right? So, uh, so when I'm talking to, I, uh, when I'm talking to my, my students, I don't talk to them much differently than I'm talking to you right now. I, I just don't. Uh, I might simplify some of the sentences, but I never simplify the, the ideas. It's like uh, the ideas, they can either wrestle with the ideas or I expect them to rise to the, the, to the occasion, which they do. Um, because like I said, middle school students are way smarter than we, we uh, tend to give them credit for as, as adults. So uh, they have no problems rising to the situation. I mean, because I mean, think of it this way. Think of the complicated world we live in, the, 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 the levels of technology that could frankly baffle me to no end. It does not take them very long to, you know, define that 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 technology and 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 bend it to their advantage, because they're brilliant, right? And so I I just carry that through through other areas of life. It's like, oh, you know what? These students are brilliant, and so I can take complicated, I don't know, tax law or whatever, and uh, as long as I present it in a way that's interesting, that's the thing that counts. Is like, can I make it interesting? Can I make it entertaining? And I and, and that's not me doing something different from middle grade. That's me doing my job as an author. Uh, and I know that you are very community focused. Um, mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing, you're, you're always, and uh, I've, I've heard you talk about having other types of artists around of all types, uh, whether it's a mm -hmm. musician or uh, somebody sculpting, that energizes you, right? You, you need those people around to, to feed off their energy. Right. I, well, it makes me sound like a creative vampire. Uh, <laughs> no, because you're, you're, you're giving them energy too. So everybody's right. giving up everybody. everybody yeah. Commune of vampires. <laughs> right. Yeah. I was going to say that. <laughs> makes, it all, makes all of our next meetings very, very awkward. Um, but no, it, I, yeah, there is an energy that happens when, when I'm around other artists. I love hearing any artist talk about their craft. Uh, you know, any artist working at a high level talking about their craft, I am just fascinated with. I mean, right now I'm, I'm wearing a, a ba Basquiat shirt, shirt. Um, because I love uh, I lo love uh, his art and everything. And so, but so I'm just like any artist who is functioning and, and just doing the thing. If what if and doing the thing well, I, I want to hear you talk about it. I want to hear you talk about your craft. I want to hear you talk about your process. I want to hear you talk about your practice. Um, I want to I want to hear what brought you into love of of uh, of whatever it is you're doing. Because um, like when I was coming up in high school and college, I had no interest in, in poetry, for example. But you know, once I s start hanging out with a bunch of poets, people who love poetry, people who have poems, you slide, you cut their wrists, they bleed poetry. You know, they, they live for this stuff. They, this stuff keeps them alive. You know, you start hanging out with folks like that. And it's like, you, you take a whole new appreciation for poetry at that point, um, which is why poetry started playing more and more of a role in, in some of my works, for example. Uh, you know, same with visual artists. You know, they, you know, I can draw stick figures maybe on a good day. Um, but, you know, I surround myself with visual artists and I love how they come at the world. I love how they see the world. Uh, you know, and I, I love the, the their design eye for the world, and uh, you know, I learned from that. I, you know, so and 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 like I said, their passion for for all this stuff, you know, is infectious. But it also tells you, you know, and maybe that was the hole in my education. Like maybe I would have developed an appreciation for art or, or poetry if I had learned from someone who was passionate about poetry, as opposed to someone who just had to teach a poetry section, right? So there's a whole, whole different level of, of learning uh, that goes on when, when you're taught by people who are passionate about it, who love it. So my students learn creative writing for me, no problem. And I do not pull any punches teaching uh, when I teach creative writing. It's like, hey, there's, uh, there's the writing you learn in school, but that's not what we're gonna be doing here. <laughs> we were gonna be doing creative writing and you'll be learning creative writing from me the way we do it out in the world at the high levels and the students rise to the occasion. <laughs> Seems to me that with everything that you do, not everything, but, but with a lot of things you do, there's an emphasis in community, whether it's the different conferences you go to and the networks that you, the, the, the contacts and the, and the networking you do that you cultivated, uh, or whether it's uh, hosting your own writer's conference, uh, MoCon, and there was something similar that just happened called NoCon, which wasn't technically a conference, but got a lot of the same people were there having a lot of the same fun. <laughs> right, right. Uh, yeah, so uh, 
Yeah. So part of it is, is I didn't get here by myself, right? I didn't just bring up a fully formed writer, you know, knowing all, what to write and where to send your stuff. No, I, I, I was, I've been shaped and formed by, by community this whole, on this whole journey. And so, uh, and so it makes sense that I would want to, at the very least, pay some of that forward, right? Um, every step along the way for in my writing journey, uh, there's been a mentor that's come alongside me to help me get to the next level. Well, I've been thrilled to be able to be that sort of mentor for a lot of uh, a lot of young writers, a lot of young artists, um, and, and be that mentor for them. Um, I had a uh, you know coming up, I could not seem to make any headway in, uh, in the local community, the, the local. Uh, uh, genre community it just I just could not make any headway in it um <clears throat> but you know I, I was welcomed in some of the national some of the national conferences and in the national community and so it's like all right I don't I don't know what this means yet but I'm just sort of filing in the back of my head um but then the opportunity came around so I was just like hey maybe we should just do our own conference so uh you know I put together MoCon um, at the time, it was part of a ministry of a church. It was a, the whole idea was to have a horror writers conference in a church. That was literally the conceit of uh, MoCon. Um, and that's the way we ran it for at least the first 10, 10 to 13 years. We ran it as a horror writers conference in a church. And then writers would come in from around the country to be a part of it. And then, um, and that was a way of just sharing my, the network I developed across the country, sharing that with my local writing scene, you know, uh, Again, the whole idea of building community, uh, you know, right, right where I am. And so uh, so we actually, we ran MoCon for about 10 years, well, for exactly 10 years. And then uh, we retired it because we were like, well, 10 years is a good run. So let's uh, call it call it a day. Um, but then, and so, the, so the, the next year went by, we didn't do MoCon. And so, uh, but I started hearing from some of the folks about, hey, we really wish we could go back to church. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, all y'all are atheists. Why are y'all bugging me to go back to church? <laughs> um, and I, so then I was just like, look, I, planning MoCon is a lot. Um, it basically means I don't do much traveling for to conferences in the first quarter of the year because we hold MoCon like the first weekend in May. So it means I, I don't get to go to conferences before then, really. Um, and my productivity is definitely in the toilet because I'm just planning, planning, planning uh, MoCon, uh, you know. And so I'm just like, it, it takes a lot. So why don't we, I tell you what, I could do a compromise and we could do NoCon. And what NoCon is, is basically, hey, me and my family, we're at home this weekend. <laughs> That's it. We're still home that weekend. So if y'all want to come by and hang out all day, we, we are willing to do that. And so, uh, so we did NoCon the following year. And uh, how many did we have? We had like 40, 40 plus people throughout our house uh, that weekend. And we're like, you know, at this rate, we could just do MoCon because 40 of y'all are still going to show up. That's <laughs> near MoCon level numbers anyway. So we'll we just go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll bring back MoCon. And so, so we did, and then, uh, so we ran MoCon for another three to four years before the pandemic hit. Um, and uh, with the, the slight pivot is that uh, we didn't do, we no longer held it in a church. We would hold it in different community venue spaces. Um, and then we would partner more, more intentionally with, uh, uh, so like our meals would be catered by uh, black entrepreneurs. And then we'd have uh, different visual artists highlighted during the, the, the in the space and, you know, just as a way to tie in more of the local artistic scene to MoCon uh, in terms of how it moved uh, within the, the local community, so. You're so tied into the networks of Indianapolis. You know Indianapolis history. Every time I, I, I come to see you, I learn something new about Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Can you ever see yourself relocating to another city? No, no. As a matter of fact, I'm actually uh, in the morning. Oh, I haven't cleared it with the school yet, so I gotta probably do that. But anyway, uh, tomorrow I'm taking a, a walking tour of. Uh, where am I walking? I think tomorrow we're, I'm doing a walking tour of uh, Indiana Avenue with a local historian um, to learn more about uh, Indiana Avenue during its heyday. So um, that's in no way tied to my next middle grade novel or anything. But, uh, <laughs> but if it were, that sure would be a wonderful way to both educate your students and learn more and get your research knocked out. Correct. <laughs> um, 
and, but I mean, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm always loving to investigate more uh, Indiana history or Indianapolis history in particular. Uh, I, I love uh, doing that sort of investigation. I love doing that sort of learning because, uh, well, one, uh, Indianapolis is part of who I am. I mean, it's part of my identity. So uh, the, the, me interrogating Indianapolis is just an extension of me interrogating part of who I am and interrogating my identity since I'm always asking the question, who am I? Who am I meant to be? Who am I, uh, you know, what am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be? You know, since I'm always coming back to revisiting that idea, that's part of part of the process. Um, and then two, um, I see Indianapolis as uh, America and microcosm. So the more I can interrogate uh, Indianapolis, the more I'm seeing all the things that go into making America what America is, you know, I'm, I can explore by teasing apart Indianapolis. And that is why one day they're going to paint you up on a building. Maybe, maybe <laughs> Bella or some other spray paint artist is going to do it. She's going to paint you right next to Ticker and Vonnegut. Right. There you go. It'll be uh, you, Vonnegut, and I don't know, maybe John Green. <laughs> and Mari Evans, because Mari Evans is down there, too. That's true. Hey, I'm around. Barbara Shoop's here. There's, there's lots of great writers. Right, there's a lot, <laughs> lot, lot of great writers here. Right? <laughs> well, you can pay us all as, as, as vampires. It'll be, a, <laughs> it'll be a great mural. Um, I want to talk about grants, but I know you've got, and I want to talk about video games. You know, let's talk about video games first, and that will lead us into some of your uh, television projects that we may or may not be able to talk about that are that are in work right now. But you wrote for Watch Dogs 2. You wrote for a couple of other video games. Do you play video games? I know your sons do. I do not. Um, I quit playing. When did I quit playing? I quit playing video games in the early 90s, mostly because I would go on... <laughs> there's no other word to describe it benders uh where a new game would come out and i would play the game non-stop until i beat it it didn't matter how many days passed i would just play the game non-stop until i beat it and so i would miss school i would miss work it didn't matter i was going to beat the game um barely eating barely sleeping i was just there playing the game and so i would you know after a while, I said, I just can't. This is, speaking of things that are not sustainable, I can't live life like that. And so it was easier for me to give it up cold turkey than it was to, like, find a healthy way to deal with all that. So, but it's uh, interesting because, uh, you know, come down to do the Watch Dogs 2, that's like, uh, you know, nothing impresses middle school students. So we start there. But, uh, you know, they give me credit for being a consultant on, on a video game. Basically, I get a full credit for consulting on a video game. I get a full credit because I did a, a Black Panther short story. And then I get half a credit for actually writing a, a middle grade novel. So, But to them, that's my entire writing career. Well, it's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, that was all, if that was all anyone knew, that right there is already... Uh, pretty, pretty impressive. We even talk about Tales uh, of Wakanda. For those who don't know, Maurice routinely has, I don't know, how many Black Panther t-shirts do you own in addition to the Black Panther uh, sticker on your car and the uh, Black Panther stuff all around your home? How many how many shirts do you own? And there's there's all the bobbleheads uh, for those who are listening to us. Maurice is showing me the impressive Black Panther collection behind him. And I just saw in your kitchen you had uh, some of the same Batman, figure, uh, Batman figures I proudly own. Mm -hmm. Uh, hanging up uh, above your sink, which I was uh, so impressed by. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, how, how exciting was that for you? Was that not the ultimate fan experience to get to write your own uh, Black Panther story? Oh, absolutely. Uh, especially since Black Panther is actually one of my favorite characters. Um, I have... Ooh, give me one second. So, yeah, so you can't see this on the podcast, but, you know, here you go. This is uh, Fantastic Four, number 52. Introducing the sensational Black Panther. It's his first appearance. Wow. So I go way back with Black Panther. Did you buy that when it came out or did you acquire it after? I am not that old. Come on now. <laughs> Honestly, I'm showing my own ignorance. I don't know when that issue would have been released, if that would have been right. in your childhood or before that. It, it actually, I believe it came out a year maybe two before I was born. Oh. So you never had to live in a world that didn't have Black Panther in it. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so you've got the original. How many comic books do you have? Uh, I had to stop collecting when my children were born. 
And so I stopped at about 20,000. Wow. And would you ever sell those? I know they're each too precious. You got to keep them there wrapped in, in plastic in case you want to read them again. Uh, I wouldn't at this point, like I would, I don't even know if I would even dare take them out of the plastic. Um, uh, would I sell them? I don't know. I, I, I do not know. <laughs> I mean, you're at conferences all the time, so there's no there's no small amount of opportunities that come your way. It must not be something that you've ever seriously considered. Yeah. Uh, no, but actually, writing comic books is still on my uh, my geek to do list at some point. So nobody uh, had you write a comic book yet. Not yet. Not yet. Well, if you're listening, to comic book writers, here he is. You. <laughs> 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 He has Black Panther experience. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> so uh, we were talking uh, briefly about uh, video game writing. Um, so how do you get hooked up with a gig like Watch Dogs 2? And if you're if you never played since the 90s, um, what? To, how do you go about researching a thing without becoming re-addicted to, to video games to understand the yeah. horror? Well, I mean, that's, uh, well, because I, I actually don't need the game. Uh, because it all comes down to writing, and uh, writing I can do. Uh, and so uh, a lot of it boiled down to, you know, pouring over scripts and then figuring out how the scripts work. And then I was like, all right, well, okay, i I'm, I'm got it here. And so then I'm going to dive in at, at that point. So I never actually play the game. It's all about, you know, delivering the script. I can deliver a script. Um, now, how I get into something like that uh, basically boils down to, frankly, just networking. Um, uh, I mentioned that uh, I went to the World Horror Convention in, back in 2002. And uh, I, I have a picture of like the first group of friends I met there. Um, and it's me and uh, three buddies of mine. We're having a toast and, so, and, and, the, and the toast gets captured on, 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 as a picture. Well, two of those friends end up going on to being major video game writers. And so, uh, so then the opportunity came up for with Watch Dogs 2, and then my friend was just like, hey, I know someone who would uh, fit the bill on this. It's my friend Maurice. And so uh, he, he brought me in, and uh, that's how I became a part of uh, Watch Dogs. It's all about who you know. And did, mm -hmm. you, did you play Watch Dogs 2 one, when it came out? No, nope, I still have not played either game. I do have a copy of Watch Dogs 2, and my sons have played it. Uh, but uh, I, I have not, I've watched them play it. But I, I myself have not played it. I played it. It came out great. <laughs> so, <laughs> <coughs> uh, and then let's talk a little bit. I don't know how much you can say, uh, but I know you've been spending a fair amount of time uh, on the West Coast working on um, various television. Uh, you know, I'm going to stop there, lest I say anything that cannot be said. Right. What have you been working on in, in, in Los Angeles? Um, there's actually not a lot I can say um, because, you know, things move in such weird ways out there. Uh, so um, I, I can say that uh, my uh, the project based on my novella, Sorcerers, uh, that has been uh, that has been optioned by AMC. Um, there's been lots of movement on that project. I'm hoping to hear some good news about it here uh, uh, fairly, we'll just say sooner rather than later. Um, and I have about three other projects in various stages of, of, of development. But like I said, it's a whole different beast out there. So just sort of uh, wait and see. It's, all, it's a whole lot of hurry up and wait. So I'm in the waiting part of it. But like like literally tomorrow, someone could call up and go, OK, we have a script ready and we want to start shooting next week. Are you in? I'm like, OK, I'm sure. And I know that there are some very high profile, super famous people involved that esteemed audience would go, oh my gosh, if they knew, but I'm not gonna say, cause I'm not that kind of friend. We'll, we'll keep that between us until it's publicly announced. Appreciate it. Um, so instead, uh, esteemed audience probably thinks that I go around talking about this stuff all the time when I'm not hosting the show, but it's, it's not true. We've known each other for years now and I've never asked you, well, even though I ask every guest who comes on this show, Maurice Broaddus, have you ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? I have not. However, uh, my mother will, would regale you with a story of how our house was haunted for, because uh, my mother is, a, is Jamaican, 
Uh, much of our family are still practicing Obia people. And so the, the realm of the spirit world is uh, not too far removed from uh, our, our day to day lives. So uh, she will often regale us with uh, duppy stories of uh, former family members uh, who, who uh, hung around to you know, provide wisdom and guidance for us, um, or frankly, just annoy us. Uh, you know, so I, I personally have not seen one, but uh, she will give she would give you lots of testimony to uh, their antics and activities around the house. So you would have grown up hearing about hearing these stories, then. Oh yeah, oh yeah. In fact, uh, the story that I I spoke about uh, that got published in uh, Weird Tales magazine it's all about some uh, is, is that one in particular is about a character that my a creature called the Roland Calf. So. So, I mean, probably the um, the hardware was already there. The whatever it is that makes uh, makes us who we are. These <laughs> horror writers in Indianapolis who also love middle grade. <laughs> it's, it's a select club, but how wonderful it is! Um, yeah. And um, but but having something like that for me, it was my grandmother who was uh, who was telling me stories. I think that takes what's already there and just sort of germinates it, if if, mm -hmm. if that's the right metaphor. Yeah, well, I mean, if at the very least, um, it, it's what helps stoke my love of stories, right? It, uh, stories, these fantastical stories as, uh, as bedtime stories. She would, uh, and, and not just, and it wasn't stories for stories' sake. It was a, there was a, a reason behind it. What she was doing is passing down her culture from one generation to the next. So was, these are the stories that she came up hearing that she would pass them down because that was uh, how uh, the the memory, the cultural memory gets passed along. So there was a great intentionality behind uh, the stories that got told. And so, you know, I grew up, even though I didn't appreciate it when I was younger, when I was younger, but I was being steeped in stories at that time. And of course that's gonna come back and uh, play a part of uh, a, a young creative's life. Um, uh, watch the time it's, it's flown by it always does but i want to make sure that we talk a little bit about grants because this is something that you impressed upon me and a number of other writers that i don't think enough writers know enough about and that's just how many grants are out there and available so when did you become aware of grants and i know you teach a whole course on it that we're not going to get into here but mm -hmm. what are maybe just some quick tips to get for writers who need to go out there and get grants to help fund their writing yeah, so like I said, I went to uh, the World Horror Conference uh, convention in uh, 2002. Um, it opened up my world, and all of a sudden, and I came back, you know, all excited, and and I was, you know, telling my wife, I have to start going to these. You know, this is where it's at. This is what I have to do as a as a creative, and and to get to that next level as a writer. And uh, and her response was, hey, you know what? The first one can come out the family budget, but you know, if you want to do this on a regular basis. You know, you have to figure out how to do this off of your uh, off of your own writing, and so uh, so one. That's when I started, you know, aiming for strictly strictly professional markets moving forward. So it's like I need to only sell to places that could get me paid, and then uh, and so you know that led to me going to more and more conferences. But then the other thing that fueled me being able to go to conferences was uh, applying for different uh, uh, grants that were available for emerging artists. And so one of the things I tell people is like, so many of the major cities have uh, their own arts councils. Uh, I know we have the Art Council of Indianapolis here. Um, so you want to look at that. Uh, look at the local humanities chapter. Like for, like I said, for us, it'd be Indian humanities. You know, what, what kind of grants do they have going on? And then the state itself will have... Uh, uh, an, an arts commission. So we have the Indiana Arts Commission. So what, what grants are available there? Um, then there's just plenty of uh, other national networks that, uh, that you know, cause, but basically once you start going down, once you become aware of the fact that grants exist um, for, for, for artists, then, uh, then it's just like researching any other market. And that's why I, I tell people, it's just like, it's no different than researching a market and then applying, uh, and then creating your story for that market, right? It's the same sort of process. And so, uh, you know, so I, I researched the markets, figure out what, uh, um, what the, some of the best ones are for me. And then I also just keep one ear to the ground. I have, I have several friends who they 
are constantly researching grants too. I, I was just scrolling right before this uh, podcast. I was scrolling through uh, Facebook and then uh, I, I made a, I saved a couple of posts because some buddies of mine had just said, hey, these here are two grants that have just popped up that I'd never even seen before. I was just like, oh, these are brand new. I'd never seen these. And so I like made a note. So I'm like, let me go, I'll go back and research those more thoroughly uh, down the road. Cause you know, I won't be able to do, do more as an artist. And, um... So many more questions to, to ask, but I know that you're going to be around. I'm going to be around. You're going to write more books, and we'll do this again down the road. Yeah. Um, but this has been an absolute pleasure. It's been an honor to have you on the show, and I'm, I'm so proud to call you my friend. Uh, for tonight, my uh, final question is always some variation of if you could go back toward the start of your career, middle of your career, wherever it would have been useful, and give yourself some advice that would have made easier your path and might make easier the path for everybody who's watching or listening to us right now, what would you go back and tell yourself? Be more you. Yeah, because, you know, coming up, it was, uh, you know, like I said, I was going up against editors who are trying to uh, change who I was, change what I was trying to write, minimize my voice, make me smaller. Um, and that takes a toll, right? And there's times when, you know, you start you do start minimizing yourself, you know, maybe this is what it takes to fit in. But I'd just go back and say, uh-uh, uh-uh, be more you. Be more you. Be loud. Take up room. Be present. Do the thing. I think that's the perfect note to end on. Where can esteemed audience find you online, follow you on social media and all that good stuff? I make my branding pretty easily. So it's a, everything's Maurice Broadus. So Facebook, Maurice Broadus. Twitter, F Maurice Broadus. Instagram, Maurice Broadus. My website, mauricebroadus.com. Hi, as always, esteemed audience for interviews with thousands of literary agents, editors, authors. Uh, Maurice Broadus, uh, his first appearance on the show. You can hear the uh, first conversation we ever had. Uh, our, back in 2017, our, our, our panel discussion here in Indianapolis is available in the back catalog. Look forward, esteemed audience. You can enjoy even more conversation. Um, as always, download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. It will change your life. And God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.